So the next step we go is the district conventions. District conventions are, are a different animal because they, they're a step in the progression, but you're not required to attend. Once you're elected as a delegate at your county convention, in most cases, how most counties operate, and again, go to your county planning organization, but in most counties, when they elect delegates at their county convention, that delegate is elected both for the district convention and for the state convention. I'm not aware of it. I haven't talked to anybody in a county where they actually have a separate election for district convention delegates and county convention delegates. I mean state convention delegates. But again, I know, I don't know about your end, Jack, but when you get into a, a county the size of, of Mecklenburg or, or Guilford or Wake, some of the larger counties, they may actually break it out. Typically, if you're going to go to the county convention, you're going to end up getting the right to be a delegate to both. You'll be on the list. But make sure, and you have the right to request a copy of that list of delegates. And again, even though the Republican Party is a private organization, and I won't cover that to start, but the thing we all have to understand, we hear people scream and holler about, well, the Republican Party did this, the Republican Party did that, and it's not, and it's violating this and that and the other. There's a lot of legal things that the party doesn't have to do if it's not spelled out in their plan of organization because it is a private club. I know a lot of people seem to think that the two predominant parties are governmental operations. The Democrat Party and the Republican Party are both private organizations. So you always have, whenever somebody starts screaming about the legal things of the parties doing this or the parties doing that, believe it or not, if it's spelled out in that, and our state plan of organization is actually, it's not that hard to follow. It's 32 pages and there are tables and everything else in it, and a lot of it's multiple, so it's, you know, if it's not spelled out in that state plan, though, or if it's spelled out ex outside of what you would consider to be a normal governmental proceeding, they have that right. You also have the right to make those changes both at your county convention and as you move up. State plan is re the state plan is resubmitted every year. If you go to state convention, one of the four proceedings that happens is the adoption of the state plan of organization. There is, a, um, and it, it is every year. Unlike officers and various other things, it, it's not an every other year situation. There is a, um, it's one of the standing committees required by the state plan of organization that there is a plan of organization committee at every state um, convention. That's why in the wonderful day that we have now of the internet, of course, they've always got the current one up on the website. But always look and make sure. <laughs> because like I said, there are some counties that I, as I was researching some of this this week, I actually went to a couple of counties where they had their own specific plan of organization. But the most recent one was like 2007. Yes, sir? And that's, the, that's one of the other things that, that again, that's why I was, that we get, when we get to the district conventions, that's, that's where they've got, a, they've got a little different game or a little different part to play in the organization of the state. There are a lot of these state positions within the state committees that actually happens at the congressional district, not at the county convention. And I think that there's been a lot of things that have happened in this state in the Republican Party over the last... X number of years that were allowed to happen because people were going to their county convention and being elected a delegate, and they were elected a delegate to their district convention and to the state convention, but because they know they don't have to go to the district convention and go to state, a lot of people don't show up at the district convention. I mean, our district is, you know, every congressional district in the state now is 700 or 680,000, give or take, voters. Republican Party's 30. 6%, 34% in the state now. So legitimately, you could have one in every 250 of that number of voters in that congressional district to show up. Well, we held ours in a room that I know
no wooden uh, last year that would not seat 300 people, and it wasn't full. But a lot of things, and particularly for that presidential, and we'll get into that here in a second, but there's a lot of things that are done on the procedure side of the state party that happen at the district convention, and then they're basically gone through, the, they're sent to the committee, and then they're, unfortunately, it sort of becomes, in most cases, a, a basically a rubber stamp situation at the state convention. So the district convention, even though it doesn't have a lot of emphasis put on it, there are a lot of things that happen at the district convention that do directly affect what happens at the state level. Now, every district can't have their own plan of organization. There's not a single district in the state of North Carolina right now that has a plan of organization that operates outside of the state plan of organization. From what I'm able to find out, in most cases, most of the districts aren't exactly what you call real active operations. It's, it's you know, I know that our district was totally out of the rules for two years. You know, there's certain requirements of the district. One of them is that they have to hold a district exec committee at least once every calendar quarter. And it has to be published and it has to be publicized. I know we went almost two years without a single executive committee. We had a, we had a district chair who was actually elected to another position and never resigned his district chair position. So we got that resolved, fortunately, this last one. But again, all of these things can happen at each of these conventions, and if we're, if we're not aware and we're not paying attention, there are some people in, there are some nice people in the state that will just sort of say, well, you don't really matter, and we're going to make our own rules, unless you show up and say something. Wasn't that diplomatic, Jim? Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, at odd number of years at the district convention, you elect officers of the district. And these district officers, as the gentleman said earlier, have an effect on a lot of things that happen because those are where the appointments to a lot of these standing committees within the state party happen. So if you want to be involved, the best way is to have your name on that delegate and then also show up at your district convention. Make sure you're involved in who the chair is. Make sure you're involved in who the officers of the district are. Because one of the things that happens is every district chair immediately becomes a member of the state executive committee. The other thing that happens is state executive committee members are elected at district conventions. So if you want to be on the North Carolina GOP state executive committee, um, and you don't go to the district convention, you're probably not going to be there unless you've got somebody that kind of slides you in and they, again, just like with the county, they'll have a nominating committee that will put this whole slate of state committee um, nominees up. Again, going back to Robert's Rules of Order, though, you have the right at that district convention to stand up and say, I would like to have my name put in the nominee. They have to have an open nominating process for state executive committee meetings. Yes, sir? How many executive committee members of each district? Uh, it's one for each. There's the chair, vice chair, and then one additional for each 8,000 Republicans in the district. So like I said, you look at, at the average district in the state, 700,000, 30%, 21,000, you know, 210,000. Divide that by eight, or 200 divided by 8,000, so that's what, 20. You can have 30 people from your district on the state executive committee. Now, I'm not sure they've ever had, I don't know how many, Jack, I know you went to the last executive meeting, how many attendees were there? See. This gets back to this numbers thing that we'll talk about in a minute, but you as an individual and 25 of your friends can have a direct influence on what happens with the whole state party. I mean, it's, it's you know, the, you don't, bingo, you don't understand, you know, that, and, and again, there's not being, you know, I, I was glad Robert wanted to put this on the program today because this is the kind of stuff that, I mean, it just goes on and there's so many of the old school, 
establishment players in the state party that keep going along and going along and going along because nobody's showing up to do anything about it. You know, again, go back to the point, starts at your house, goes to your precinct, goes to your county, goes to the district, goes to your state. Yes, sir? Are you talking about the Senate Committee or the State Executive Committee? This is the State Executive Committee. Well, the last State Executive Committee had like 200 or something. Was that the Central? That was after the Executive? Yeah, the Central Committee only had like... It's, well, it actually, you know, it, it's undersized at least by the plan of organization also. But, you know, the, again, all I can recommend is I'm trying to go through and get you to high spots. Everybody, I, I don't think there's anybody here that doesn't have a computer, is there? And it's not a real hard thing to read, and you can go, it's broken up into real simple steps. But these are things that are happening every year or every other year at these district, county, and then on to the state convention that are just happening. You know, I know there's a concern within some of the establishments, all of a sudden we have all these new people showing up, so there have been some hygiene done with the rules in some of them. But if you don't know the rules, just like the presentation earlier, you can't change the rules. Just real quick, if anybody is here from the following counties, please check with Guy Leader, because you had no representation last year. Camden, Clay, Hertford, Hyde, Jones, Randolph, Tyrell, Yatkin, Yancey. No representation last year. The following county, 16, had one person at the state convention. Baldwin, Coswell, Davidson, Davey, Graham, Hope, Martin, Montgomery, Northampton, Cotank, Pasquotank. Thank you. And Bonds, <laughs> Hope, Stokes, Vance, Warren, and Wilkes. You only had one person at the state convention. And we'll cover why that is so important here in just a minute. In, in Wilmington. Sorry, two years ago. Wilmington. Yeah, Wilmington. Sorry. <laughs> Well, good. Hopefully we'll have more people waking up as I hope you will go back and share this with your groups about how they can become involved. Now, the other major thing that happens at the district convention, and I'm going to settle something that seemed to be a big misunderstanding at this last national convention. At your district convention on presidential election years is when your RNC delegates are elected. There was a big amount of noise made about delegates being bound or not bound. Everybody remember all that? Okay, now, at your district convention, because of the requirements to be a delegate to the RNC, Part of your being elected an RNC delegate is you have to declare the candidate you support. Your fellow delegates at your district convention determine whether they're going to elect you as an RNC delegate, in a lot of cases, by who you declare that you are going to support. At that point, you are bound. If your fellow delegates at your district convention who are duly elected delegates from your county convention, who are duly elected delegates from your precinct meeting, elect you as an RNC delegate, you are required to submit in writing at your district convention who you support in the presidential race. And it doesn't really matter where it's at in the primary or whatever. At that point, if, you're, if your fellow delegates at the district convention elect you as a candidate, the only way that you are no longer bound is if that particular candidate withdraws themselves from the slate at the national convention and releases their delegates. They actually have to, and, and there is actually a, a form within the RNC that they actually have to formally sign and submit to the credential committee at the RNC releasing their delegates. So if you elected somebody at your district convention, and, and you know that was one of the things, 
not to get off on a rabbit trail, but one of the things that really bothered me about what happened at the RNC this year, every person who votes in a state delegation needs to be announced from the chair. They need to have, you know, you know they sort of ramrod through that there was, you know, 104 delegates for Mitt Romney and 12 others. Uh, actually, I think in the proceedings, if you look at the rules of the RNC, I don't know if they made a change in this, and Jack and I were there, they may know, but they violated the rules of the RNC by not announcing who other delegates voted for in each state delegation. Just one of the little things that just ticked me off when I was watching them. <laughs> Now, the other thing is, again, the, the credentials have to be filed with the State Convention Credentials Committee. Now, this is one where there's a little more latitude because the state chair can actually, he can pretty much pronounce at what period. The, state, the basic plan says within 30 days of the district convention, but I think that the, you know, the chair can the state chair can arbitrarily set a date. It can't be less than 30 days, but he can say, well, as long as it's in the hands of the credentials committee 10 days prior to the state convention. But again, I'd be real interested to have the time to go to Raleigh and look through the actual file paperwork with our state credentials committee to see how many valid credentials listings they have from both the districts and from the counties. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. They have to they have to put it in writing. It has to be submitted to the district chair prior to their being when they do their you know, they're nominated as a potential delegate. When they come up and do their little, uh, I think at our district finish, they allow two minutes. You have to have it in writing submitted to the district chair, and you have to declare it at the microphone at your district convention who you will be supporting. And it has, and, and it can be any valid candidate who is on the Actually, I think the, the rule now is it has to be somebody that is on the ballot in your state for your state primary or your state caucus. But at the time we held our district conventions last year, there were still, I think there were still seven candidates that were, or five candidates that were still active. Daniel, there's still six or seven candidates still active? Was there, I mean, candidates within our district that were active? There were, I think there were, I know we had, I think there were still, there were either still five or six that were still Santorum was still there, Romney was still there, Paul was still there. So when you so if you want to be a delegate to the next RNC convention, that's part of what you have to do. You have to you have to declare who you are going to support at the national convention. Yes, sir. So did you learn something earlier from what Scott presented? Because I think unless, unless your district plan of organization specifically says it's not being run under Robert's Rules of Order, the state plan says it is. Also, yeah, Lee. I was going to address his concern right there. I was sixth district as well, and a vote was taken. Anything in that plan of organization could be suspended with a 70% voice vote. And I think that's what happened at the sixth district. Okay, they, they, exactly. They, they did not have to declare. They suspended the rules just by a voice vote. Is that is that proper, Scott? Mr. Covey, um, that's proper. As long as they, as long as they follow Robert's rules of order under which their district convention is designed to operate. Okay. If it, they took a voice vote, and they did not have to declare who they supported. Right. So if the state plan doesn't require that, then yeah. Well, 
and Scott, I think that's how that though is again. If if the district, and that's why I'm saying when I looked, I couldn't find any district that had a had a separately filed plan of organization. Now there's a chance they may have done so 15 years ago, and if it's not redone at every convention, then it automatic the the deal with these plans of organization at the county, district, and state level. They are voted on every year, but if it's not carried in a vote at your convention, then the most the most recently, um, that's what I'm looking for, Scott. The, yeah. oh, the most recently adopted plan of organization is the one that is in effect. But like I said, there's some that I can understand where they they made changes, but then they didn't follow the credentials requirement and get them registered with the state. So even though they said they did the vote and changed the plan of organization, if they don't meet that deadline for the requirement for credentials filing, then they're not void. I mean, they're not valid. So make sure if any of these conventions, you know, you, you have the right to inquire from the, and, and the other thing that's different too is at districts and counties, there are several that have a county chair of the party who is not the chair of the county executive committee. The credentials are all handled by the chair and secretary of the executive committee, not of the county party. Sorry, I've heard a couple of hijinks of that being used too. <laughs>